just had a, a dollar in the retirement fund for every gate I ever opened or closed. <laughs> <laughs> well, after you stepped out, I was like, oh, shoot, I should have stepped out and done that for you. Sorry, I wasn't thinking. Now we can let one of the one of the fellows behind us do the closing. dollar for each time, huh? <laughs> or a quarter even? sitting down like that and the other one standing behind him. It's really cool setting and the way he's sitting reminds me of that print. Yeah. These, uh, these settlers down here in this community on the Santa Fe Trail years ago, they, they'd go up to the Black Canyon to cut firewood and one guy got caught in a blizzard on the way home and he got down to a certain point he couldn't see and then his mule wanted to turn and he thought his mules was trying to turn too quick and he made them go on uh -huh. and then he got stuck in a snow drift and they had to go out and rescue him but he was already frozen so bad he got gangrene and died and he said and then he figured out oh if i just let my mule turn when it wanted to right. i would have been safe he, yeah, he knew, knew where, where to go going. Mm -hmm. yep. Here in Kansas, we're predominantly an agricultural state. So, you know, historically when this, this area, area was settled, any flatland ground that could be farmed was and continues to be. And so, you know, we are in the breadbasket and the heartland of, of America too. So um, there has been a shift in more um, wise use of the land over the last decade or two, and it's a good thing to see. Um, and grazing is always gonna be a part of Kansas history and, and agricultural culture itself. Um, so, yeah, it's important to, to preserve these, these pristine and, and precious uh, grazing rangelands prey systems, so. So back in the early, early to mid 20s, 1924, 1925, the, uh, at the time, we were called Kansas Fish and Game Department. And we took a stance back then, you know, that we were gonna be part of conserving and restoring bison in North America. And we've always, we've always uh, had bison since then, and, and that scattered out through, through the state. And in the you know, early, in 1944, Maxwell uh, Wildlife Refuge was donated to the state of Kansas by the Maxwell brothers, but it wasn't until I believe 1950 or 1951, the bison were actually introduced here. When you got this gate cut off, when you got this, yeah, then this is in the back half of it, and they don't want to. They don't want to come. They want to come up and hang up in this corner. 
So this gate, this should have been solid here, and the gate should have been here. Right. Well, I can see the benefit of having, I guess, two more bullpens because that way, if, if we need to shuffle, you know, if we got one in the back that we really need to shuffle around, and this is unutilized space anyway, and to, to narrow this down, redo that gate, it might might be worth talking about some more, I guess. I don't know. And then somebody was, Troy or somebody was unhappy with my stiff ropes and they thought I ought to replace <laughs> every last rope on the corral before the next auction. Yeah, I did hear some grumblings about the ropes too. Well, we're at the size of herd that we want for the number of acres of grazing that we have. So we handle our bison just one time a year in the fall, and we sort off some that will sell as a surplus so we can make room for next year's calf crop. So we'll sell about 50 head, sometimes a little more than that, but say on the average about 50 head a year we'll sell and uh, at this public auction that we have at our own corral. And uh, it's very uh, popular with people. We get a lot of people here for the auction, even if they're not gonna buy, we get a lot of spectators as, as well. And, uh, and of course the money that we keep and use in, back on the area, and uh, it helps us maintain the area. Out here to the west, in the northwest, is our initial catch pen. It's about 25 acres, has high fence around it. And we feed our buffalo during the dormant season, we feed them range cubes, so they're used to that. And we lure them into there with the range cubes several days before the roundup. And so we capture them there first. And there's a pond out there, they have water, they have lots of grass, and they have the range cubes. And then these gates over here on the southwest corner of the corral is where they enter this area. And this, I'll, I'll start feeding them, uh, have them follow me in here. After about two mornings, I can just shut the gate on them and capture them in here. And then the day of the roundup, we, we have a big U-shaped alley, then we can open up and that brings them around and into the uh, uh, narrower alley where we can start breaking them into smaller groups. We, we try that we come out here, some of us are on foot still, and we also have a tractor with a panel on the front that can kind of herd them. And we'll try to get about 30 or 40 of them at one time and take them down that alley and, and break them down quickly into smaller groups. And uh, then we will send them to a specific pen based on their age sex class. You know, as a, as a supervisor, it bothers me to see a whole lot of bodies down here because you just never know. So we're, we're talking about adding another tractor with another panel. Um, and those are just to provide pressure on the animals instead of the human aspect of it. I mean, we'll, we'll still probably always have to have a, a few people on foot, but if we can add another tractor with a panel and help just provide that slow pressure to get them initially going, and maybe even narrow this down a little bit where we have the panels now to, to reduce the size that they can churn and, and move around, I think is gonna help in the future. So. We're always annually, we, we try to review what went well, what didn't, and, and things we can look to improve upon. So that's that's one of the things we've, we've been discussing. So if it's a coal animal, we just open this gate and we have a, we swing this gate around and they go right back into the pans. If it's a hurt, if it's one we're, we're not working at all, we, we can just cut them out through the hex directly back out in the pasture without even coming through the alleyway in the, in the chute, so. The ones we're not going to cull or sell or work, the quicker we can get them back out on the pasture, the, the, the more we like it. So, and these are these are nice in the fact that they're adjustable. You can adjust the alley in and out, the slide gates. Are, 
real easy to work. So a lot, you know, if you got the money, a lot of these systems are built on hydraulics and you just stand up there and got one person working the levers and you can adjust in and out and the chute and the alley and everything. And, and uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily need that elaborate system here, but this is, this is pretty pretty good system for what we do. Uh, you, you can see our corral is one level. Not everybody has the luxury due to their terrain of, of doing that. They have some different levels and they'll have stairs up and down to the different levels. Well, we didn't really want people tripping and falling on stairs. So we had a little bit of a more of a hill out there and we just brought in a scraper with a laser level and our uh, Lynn, Lynn uh, Enterprise has built this facility for us at, and they're now uh, called Titan, Titan, Titan West, West, but at that time they were Lynn out of Lynn, Kansas. And they said, well, if you get it within 2% slope, we can build it all on one level. So we had that late scraper with the laser level come in here and move some of that dirt out of that little hill out there and build up this end to where we just had that 2% slope and, and then we built everything on one level. You can see how the, the big U-shaped alley that brings them in here narrows down from the 16 foot wide alley to the 10 foot and it has all these gates in here that we can start breaking them down into smaller groups. And then the swing arm here on the, on the tub brings them around to our hex. We're built around a hex. And uh, this is where we do a lot of our final sorting right here. Some of the older adult cows, they'll get in here and, and uh, get kind of worked up and you gotta just let them settle and calm down and then find the right hole the right gate to go through but and sometimes they'll they'll try to spin once when we're bringing or sending animals they'll get in that alley or just come in and they'll spin right around so the person running that gate right there has got to be really on their toes because that's the nobody necessarily wants to run that gate but it's it's an important gate and it overall it you know i think now that we've we've kind of changed our tactics for you know reduced our crew size a little bit um, try to work them quietly and methodically and slower. And I think it's, it's worked out better the last few years. Um, we just take our time, you know, the old adage, even working cattle slower is better, you know, slower is faster overall. And, and I think we've kind of adopted that mentality somewhat here too. And it's, it's been working pretty good. So, so this gate, if they're, if they're staying in the herd, they can, we can release them right out this way into the pasture, those bleachers won't be there at that time yet. Uh, I'll usually move them in right before the auction but day, but they can exit that way. This is our auctioneer platform for our auction. And we have a little table we bring up here and, and the auctioneer and I are up here. And uh, so the animals come out of the hex on sale day, they come out of the pen and they bring them in right here. And this is where they, right behind you here is where they enter the, the cell ring. This is our cell ring and here's our bleacher set up. And uh, we'll have pretty much full capacity uh, crowd for, for the sale. And uh, we'll bring them in here in little groups, usually three at a time. And they're all, they all have a hip tag and numbered hip tag and we've handed out sheets with the list of animals and their no tag number and uh, they can follow right along with the sale or everybody can and uh, we start with the lowest numbered animal and sell it first and work up to the highest number in each group during auction you'll see those shields in the three corners we have staff that are staged behind those and uh, this year, uh, at the end of the auction, one of the two and a half year old bulls actually jumped behind this shield over here with our staff member behind there. And so he was able to scramble out of there and nothing happened. He's okay, the animal's okay, but that was one of the main things that we identified that we've got to change for the future. So 
So Cliff's come up with, with some ideas um, on how we can keep staff out of the arena um, and still be able to, to be have that presence to keep them moving in and out of the auction ring. So we see things every year that we can tweak to make things better for staff and the, and the animals. So if you'll notice that, that white panel there coming out of the Where they came out of the cell ring, ring. They, they were balking all the time and not wanting to go because the shadow was across there like that. And we painted that white and that made a big difference. Once we made that, just that little design change and painted that panel, you know, I was amazed that we opened that out gate and they'd see that immediately and just out they'd go. And, and even people that have been coming here for years, that they commented on that the first year, like, man, that was a that was a neat change. And to see just how one little modification like that could really, number one, reduce the stress on the animals. Number two, really make things a lot more efficiently during auction time. It was that time of year in the fall, you're starting to get the lower sun and you're getting shadows across there and it's hard for them to see in there, know what's in there. Uh, we've improved some of that by painting the inside of certain places white so they can see in there better. And so we're gonna paint the inside of this one white too. And then maybe instead of them spinning when they come from the pen to be worked, instead of them spinning and going back, maybe they'll see the white inside of that and go on over here and we can shut them off here momentarily and then get them out and going that way. People buy bison sometimes to start their own herds or add to a herd. Some of them go straight uh, to a processing plant for meat. It's kind of a mix. And uh, that's kind of, it helps sustain the area and uh, we, that way we don't get overpopulated and overgrazed. You want to provide a healthy habitat for the animal where it has a good, healthy life up until the moment it's harvested for food. And then you do that as quickly and humanely as possible. You, you really see that among the native people. They have a deep respect for the animal and it's uh, and they're, they're very uh, strongly for that, you know, having uh, the animal, they, they like to go out and do a, a field harvest, you know, and, uh, and they have ceremonies for uh, about the hunt and uh, giving the animal a quick, a quick and proper death and all that before they go out and harvest the animal. So in our modern system, we tend to, to take them to a processing plant and, they're, and they have to be hauled to a uh, processing plant and, and seen by an ex inspector before they can be harvested. But there are some that are trying to develop mobile harvesting uh, trailers that will do it uh, in a, you know, like the feds want it to be done within a uh, more on site. And uh, that would be interesting if, if that more of that got developed. I'd like to see more of that get developed. Hey.